We'd like to start out by thanking our valuable sponsors. Sense of Satisfaction by Cricut is the place for all your fragrance needs. Plus, she's got products to heal what ails your skin and your hair. Shop at sensebycricket.com. Special thanks to our valued sponsor, John Travis, a financial coach and certified kingdom advisor with Richard Young Associates, a registered investment advisor. Thanks goes to Anna Patterson, my sister in the Lord who faithfully gives to this ministry every month. And to our newest sponsor, LaToya Gerard of Preach the Word Worldwide Network. She is a valued sponsor and a major encourager regarding this ministry. We need and would love to have you as a sponsor. Absolutely no gift is too small. Please note the info regarding giving throughout and at the end of the show and help us spread these testimonies around the world. Please note that the views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily the viewpoints of our sponsors. It's time to hear the story, make the connection, learn the lesson, and gain the wisdom. Are you ready? Let's get charged and be changed. The Sister Speak Brother Break Show. Conversations on grace, healing, and deliverance. This is Marcy Bush. Come on, let's journey together. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Sister Speak Brother Break Show. Y'all already know I always have a special guest sitting across from me, and today is no different. Um, Today, I have one of my big brothers from the church. He's someone whose story I've heard mostly through our pastor, um, just using him as an example, giving bits and pieces of his testimony along the way. Um, but I've admired him. I've seen the growth from somewhat of a distance. Um, you know how there are those people that you can you see and you know you can go to and you know if you need something you can ask them if you need prayer you can go to them that kind of thing it's like that but i don't know a lot about his um the the i guess the intricacies of his journey so like many of my guests um we'll be finding out more about maurice brightharp together today um so i encourage you Lock in because I'm sure there's going to be something you can use in your own life from this. So, Maurice, thank you so much um, for agreeing to sit across from me and and us just have this conversation because, um, like I said, I've seen your life from a little bit of a distance um, over the last several years. Um I know I've been at, because we go to the same church, so I've been at the ministry, I want to say 25, 26 years, somewhere in there. And I know you're in the 20s too, 26, I believe. 26. Okay. 26. Yeah. So we probably ended up there around the same time. That's correct. Um, two very different places in our lives, but ended up at the same location. And um, so and we just want to hear your journey today. I'm honored to be here today with you well, to share my you. journey. Thank you. So usually we start at the beginning. So tell me, how was it in your younger life? In my younger life, uh, with my alcoholism, it started as a young boy around the age of nine to 10 years old. When we used to have family gatherings, um, for the Christmas or Thanksgiving holiday, alcohol was an easy access because of my uncles who were from uh, out of town, they would come home and we would sneak and get a drink. Mm -hmm. So basically a lot of times they didn't know we were doing it, right? but it was easy to have access to it as a young man because mm -hmm. it was there. And so we would sneak and get it. So okay. that started me on a path of destruction. I would say it in that terms because I feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 10, 11, it took, only on a few sips to understand that I was beginning to get hooked. Okay. Because I start wanting it more, mm -hmm. but didn't know how to get it. 
So as we have older cousins, friends right. that we used to grow up with, they would buy it for us. Okay. So then that was a, another key way that it really took off into the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So as a young man, I, I really didn't understand it, what was really going on. But into my teens, as I got older and start driving, I knew I had something was different about me. Okay. Uh, my friends used to always say, hey, man, you know, you need to quit. You drink too much. And mm-hmm. I said, man, you know, uh, I didn't pay it no attention. Okay. Because there was a problem, but mm-hmm. I didn't know I had a problem. Mm-hmm. And then it started to even grow even worse as I got into about the 10th or the 11th grade. So during this time, you know, I used to always say, well, what's, what's wrong with me? You know, my friends used to go out. They used to have a good time and look like I was just going overboard, overboard, okay. overboard. And it seemed like I couldn't stop. Mm-hmm. So I said to myself, well, this weekend I'm not going to drink as much. Mm-hmm. But it never worked. Okay. It never worked. Wow. I've always would keep going further and further into it. So when I graduated high school, I started getting in trouble getting DUIs. Mm-hmm. So when you used to get a DUI back then, they would tell you, you know, go spend 24 hours in the drunk tank, and then they would just let you go. Okay. And that was the real beginning of everything started really unraveling for me because I didn't get just one, two, three. I had four. Okay. So I had one in Augusta, Georgia, as I can recall. And during all this time, I used to always say, what is wrong with me? Hmm. And my other friends could go out go to the party, go home, nothing would never happen to them. But for me, I used to get stopped. So as it started unraveling, my dad, who used to work at the VA hospital, he used to always chastise me and say, hey, you need to stop doing that. But I thought my father didn't love me because Mm -hmm. I was having a good time. Mm -hmm. But not understanding the direction he was telling me to go in, It was not a good time. It was on a path of destruction. Right. And I didn't listen. And he used to keep telling me, keep telling me, you need to stop. So one day he said, I'm going to take you to talk to one of the counselors over at the VA hospital so we can curb this drinking because you begin stopped by the police more and more and more. Mm-hmm. So he took me. And when he took me, I talked to this counselor. He was telling me about how it was going to affect my life if I didn't stop. But he didn't have any answers for me that I could just grab on to to say, hey, I need this to stop. But Mm -hmm. it was just questions after question after question. But I didn't have no answers for me. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't have any answers for me, I didn't know how to stop. Mm -hmm. So they put me on this medication. And when they put me on this medication, so when you used to, they put it on you, you can't drink no alcohol because if you did, it would make you sick. Okay. So what was the easy thing for me to do? Stop taking it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I stopped taking it. Okay. And so my dad, he got kind of upset and he said this, I don't know what's wrong with that boy. That boy is going, he too smart, make good grades in school, but he's just going down the wrong path. Mm-hmm. By me being the youngest out of nine, I'm my mother's youngest child. Okay. My mom really was the last one to really just kept, kept me going. Every time I would get in trouble, she would make my dad come get me out. Okay. Not ask him. She was okay. telling me she used to make him. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't learn all this until I got to be an adult about when I got about 28 years old. I used okay. to sit on the porch and say, Mama, you used to make him? She said, yeah, because I, I didn't want you there. Mm-hmm. But when she cut that string off, mm-hmm. then I didn't have nobody. Right. So right. as I progressed into my early years. When well, I, hang on. Let's go. Let's go back a little bit. So remember where you where you are. This was where you were. Um, at now was once you left the counselor, but kept getting in trouble. So let's let's go back to when you said it was like nine or yes. ten when you started. Yes, it was just stealing little sips here and there. That's correct. But then ten eleven is when it started getting more and more. Was there anything else going on? Just so like looking back now, knowing all that you know now. Was there anything necessarily going on or any feelings that you were battling that you think led you to that? Or do you think that was just the enemy's assignment against your life? I can say it was two factors because, see, my uncle, my dad's brother, was an alcoholic as well. 
Then he had another brother who used to drink a lot. Might as well say it was alcohol as well, too. Mm -hmm. But there was really nothing going on. I believe that that was an assignment mm -hmm. down the path for me because I understood what was going on, but not understanding what mm -hmm. I was going through. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I knew it was an assignment because my father's brother that was by him, he didn't live till he was 45. Okay. He died of cirrhosis of the liver. Mm. So I knew it was an assignment for right. me. And it was no doubt it was because... Out of all my brothers, I was their target because they didn't have the problem as bad okay. as I did. Because I was going to ask, I know you said how your friends would be like, man, you going overboard. Did your siblings yes. try to talk to you, try to try to keep you from any of that? Well, my I had one brother who was like my big brother, because, but he's not. My brother Anthony would be more of the protector of the three up under him was me, Raph, and Carl. And um, I think his biggest point, he would say, say things and it was very small. I guess he didn't want to hurt our feeling because he said, well, you know, I guess he said, you know what you're doing. But other than that, no, it was just like freewheeling, you know, just do it upon yourself. And that's the most, I think, was the only thing that I can remember that anyone would say anything. Then my brother Ralph, who was next to me, who was 11 months older than me. Me and him was the closest, but he also would drink too as well. So okay. it wasn't like we was in no competition, but it was that we was like in an equal mode, but mine was a little further out than mm -hmm. his was. And your mom and dad, when did they start to notice? I think my dad really started to notice when I got into the 11th grade. So y'all hit it. You yeah. hit it from 10 up until because by 11th grade you're 16 17 yes so you were able to hide it all that time all that time yeah he didn't really know exactly what we were doing because i'll be straight honest my father was a tight father he was very strict into education you couldn't bring no bad grades home mm -hmm. and i always made good grades mm -hmm. so it was a hiding point for me you mm -hmm. know i could hide it from it and my dad was, like I said, was a free willing man, but he also just wanted us to have opportunities that the other kids. When I was 16 years old, he bought me my first car. Okay. And he helped me get a car and I was working. You know, I worked okay. at uh, Kroger in North Augusta okay. as a teenager, so bagging groceries. Okay. So I was working. So mm -hmm. after a while, like I say, it was just a random way or easy way to get to us. Mm -hmm. So it became easier as I got older, okay. as I got into the 11th grade. Like I said, it was just easy for us to have access to it. What happened in the 11th grade, do you think, that kind of opened his eyes? Um, from what I can remember, I got into a fight at school. And during the time, like I said, we was, you know, we, uh, we could drive to school and I had some, we you know, I think it was some, I think it was Thunderbird in my car, some mm -hmm. wine in my car. And once I got in fight at school, you know, they would call your parents and your parents had to come up there. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't drive my car because I had gotten into a fight. Mm -hmm. So he got in my car and so had me hit the brakes and guess what rolled out from under the seat. Okay. That's how he started realizing there was a problem. Okay. Okay. Did it take your mom a lot longer to see? No, because my dad was the type of person. He would tell her. She okay. would tell her. No matter what, he would tell her what was going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And she told. Mm -hmm. She really did. She mm -hmm. tried her best. Mm -hmm. But I didn't pay it no attention. Okay. Okay. So, like you said, time kept kept going and you started getting deeper and deeper into um, the alcoholism, now the DUIs, you've gone to see a therapist um, or a counselor, got the medicine so that if you drank, it'll make you sick, so you stop taking the medicine. And where are we now? After I stopped taking the medicine, uh, I got ready, like I said, I got ready to graduate high school. And as I said before, my father was real big on education. So he asked me a question. What are you going to do with your life? Are you going to school? Or are you going into the military? So I told my father, I said, I want to go to school. And he said, okay, because if you don't go to school, 
you can't stay here. You have to do something. Mm -hmm. And when I realized it was time for me to do something, Marcia, mm -hmm. it was too late because okay. I had made my mind that I was just going to work. I didn't want to go to school at that moment. Okay. So I said, okay, I'm going to go down to Aiken Tech. Maybe I started at Aiken Tech and do something, but that wasn't for me during the time. Okay. So that's when I started to just go to work. Mm -hmm. And that's where we started. You know, like I said, I started falling off the cliff further and further. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she was always saying, well, why don't you go back to school and get your degree like your other siblings? Because all my other siblings, they was at South Carolina State and at okay. Morehouse. Okay. But that wasn't for me. Okay. I wanted to have fun. I wanted okay. to party. I wanted to go out and drink. So mm -hmm. that wasn't for me anymore okay. because school was behind me then. But I realized during that moment, it became more and more serious about mm -hmm. my drinking. Because mm -hmm. now I'm working. And then I was, like I said, I had my own vehicle and stuff. And it was easier access. So I moved out. Mm -hmm. I moved out of my parents' house. I got okay. my own apartment. And so that's just, yeah. More freedom. Yeah. And my dad used to always try to encourage me to stop. But like I said, at one point in my life, I didn't even think my father loved me because mm -hmm. I was too deep. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. Like I said, I had a problem, but I didn't know I had a problem. Right. Because I used to always say, I used to feel this way. Well, why he don't like me or why he don't right. love me? I'm only just having a good time. But he used to always tell me this. He said, if your friends ain't doing S, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean, mm -hmm. you ain't doing S. Mm -hmm. So that was this truth. That was right. the truth. They weren't right. doing nothing. I right. wasn't doing nothing. Right. So, and it stuck with me. And right. I, f I felt during that time that he didn't care or love me. But it didn't make me drink more because I was already hooked. Mm -hmm. I was already in. I was all the way in. Mm -hmm. So that was a part of the change in my life that I said, what is wrong with me? And I wanted to find out what was wrong with me, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I had answers. So by this time, my oldest son, like I said, after I got out of high school, he was born. Okay. And uh, he was born. So now I got double trouble. I got a child. And I still had a problem. Mm -hmm. Then I got married. And I still had a problem. Okay. And during the time that I was married to my first wife, um, it didn't last, I'd say, probably about a year. Okay. And we separated. And it intensified even greater. But I still had a son. Mm -hmm. So I was still lost. Mm -hmm. But I felt during that time, it really pushed me to a distance to where it made me feel like I wasn't worthy of myself. Mm -hmm. And doing all that, I tried and I tried to quit and I tried, mm -hmm. but nothing would ever work. Because that's one of the things that I was going to say. I know at 10, 11, 12, you know, kind of in there, uh, it may have just been that curiosity, that assignment. But at some point, it feels like it then becomes this place of hiding this place that you run to and like you said with the voices that you're battling the thing yeah although you were already drinking when you're feeling like and again it's woven into the enemy's assignment when you're feeling like you're not loved not understood um when you're feeling like okay well that's for them, but that's not for me. When you feel like the odd man out, right. all those things, even though you're drinking, it's still, but when I do, for me, I'll speak from my experience. And, I'll, and I'm saying it's what it feels like from what you're saying. I can't do nothing about all that anyway, so I'm just going to drink. And you drink he more heavily even. It's a coping mechanism. It's a way to, well, when I do this, I ain't going to be thinking about all of that and just try to get away from what's going on. It's like you said, at some point, because once once that addiction and I know there's really the physiological stuff that goes on with your body craving 
it by the time by that time since you've been doing it so long but then also like i said just those mental escapes that this is how i can this is how i can get away from that you know um so it feels like almost like this little thing i i remember one time uh, pastor hill when he was preaching at our church he talked about these pet demons but it feels like those pet demons have turned into a beast. That's correct. And it's just like consuming your life. So what you normally think, what, what it made me feel like, it's like I had something to run to. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when things didn't work out, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to go to what I know that feels mm-hmm. best for me. Mm-hmm. And it was the drinking. Mm-hmm. And, it, and like I said before, you know, it's, it's a problem that you don't know you have a problem. Mm-hmm. And that's what I ran to. And that was all the time. And, you know, to, to, to this day, I can look back now and I can talk to myself and I can see some of the wrong turns in the road that I made. But I didn't even know I was down that road. Right. Till it was too late. Right. So now I can say that. But during that time, it was just for me just getting into a comfort zone mm-hmm. because I said, you know, forget it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just going to go out and have me a good time. And mm-hmm. that's what I did. Mm-hmm. And this one, not some day, I drank every day. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I literally every single day. Mm-hmm. Every day. It wasn't a beer here, a beer No, 12 pack, whatever alcohol or gin, whatever mm-hmm. I wanted. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. So it was not something that I just say, you know, it was a weekend drinking. Right. My mine was every day. Right. And so when you, once your son came into your life, it there's still... At that point, you still had not gotten a wake up call. Not that, at all. Okay. I could function. I could drink. I could work because I have a work ethic about me that I could go to work. But as soon as I got off of work, back into what my comfort zone was. Mm-hmm. So me and her didn't last long. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but I still got a son. Mm-hmm. Now I can see that it is. Some of the things I did during his young life, it still has a hold on him. Okay. And I try not to run from it. I face it. Mm-hmm. But during that time, nothing mattered but that drinking. Right. You no, know, God, as if he was here or not, nothing right. mattered right. but that drinking. I could, I, to, to, to me, I didn't care less about anything else because it was, like I said, it was a problem that I didn't know I had a problem. hmm and I always try to I, you try to analyze it, saying, you know, I ain't going to drink so much this weekend. It never worked. Mm-hmm. It never worked. Mm-hmm. Because it had become a way of life. Right. It had became a way of mm-hmm. life in order to function. And it sounds like so. So you're you're living because once you and your first wife separated. So you're back to living by yourself. Yes. So really no accountability. None. So you just, I mean, just drinking it up. Freelance. Because like you said, if you're, if you're functional during the day, you know, then nobody sees how low you go um, in the evening. Or were, or were people picking up on it? Did people know how bad it was? I can say those close to me knew how bad it was. Okay. But if you didn't know it close, because like I said, I was still functional. I could drink all day and get up and go to work like if nothing happened mm-hmm. and restart that same cycle once I got off. Okay. But those who close to me could tell, but if you wasn't close to me, you wouldn't know it. Because mm-hmm. I could hide it. I mm-hmm. could hide it real good. Okay. And so once, once that took place you you're home you still drinking at what point did it go further down it stayed about the same it stayed about the same then that's when all the DUI start trickling in more and more couldn't you know like I said they start coming more frequently Mm -hmm. like I said when I first started back in 79 I remember it real well uh, it was just they put you in the drunk tank and they let you go. Then in 82, when they came out with the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, mm-hmm. they're mad. They start suspending your license mm-hmm. 
And then on your second offense day, uh, for first offense, excuse me, would be six months. Second offense would be a year. Mm -hmm. So it kept growing and growing through the 80s to where I would space them out, wouldn't get a DUI for a year or two. Then I get another DUI. By that time, the first one would be off your record. Then you start all the way back over. Gotcha. But I've only had a consecutive DUI where it didn't run too far apart. I think it was every three years you would come off your record. So mm-hmm. when I got my second one one time, it ran apart. And it, it was able to, I had lost my license for a, a year. Okay. So it didn't stop me from driving though. Okay. I kept driving right on, got them back. <laughs> I'm just being License, honest. no license. No license, drive. kept driving. It didn't, didn't affect it, your work at all? Not at they all. They didn't find out about nope. the, okay. During that time, you know, I was working at a Granville company. Okay. And it didn't affect my work at all. Okay. So, like I said, it didn't stop. Everything's mm-hmm. moved right along. Mm-hmm. Like nothing that's ever happened. Cause right. Even though I didn't have no license, I kept driving. Okay. And one of them is speed bumps for you. That's you it. Keep on going. Keep on going. Okay. So, um, during this time, just still life as usual, things going the same. Um, the the ladies that you did talk to, the one I know you said you were married at one time. You know your first wife. They didn't have red flags going off about the drinking. I mean, was it because you were so functional in it? Well, there were there were signs. You know, uh, most of the time, especially my first wife, she said she couldn't tolerate it. So that's why we didn't stay together that long. And, you know, to be honest with you, it, it she had the early warning signs. She seen it, we went to high school together. So okay. it was kind of like, she put up with it as long as she could. Gotcha. I use that terminology gotcha. for as long as she could. And then after that, the marriage dissolved mm-hmm. and I went on a different route. Mm-hmm. So how many years before you met or before you started to date, Patricia, your wife? Um, I think I started dating my wife after me and my first wife separated probably about two years. That's when we met, about two years later. Okay. And um, that's, you know, that's when me and her started dating, about okay. two years after that. Okay. And so even with her, did, did she see the signs in the beginning? Or was the love so strong <laughs> that all that was overlooked? I'm gonna be honest <laughs> with you. I I don't know how to how to even describe that part. Uh, but I know she could see the signs because of the things I used to still was doing. But I think she put up with it mm-hmm. because of. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you've been blessed by today's show, feel free to let us know. And if you'd like to sow into this ministry, become a sponsor or contact us. You can reach us at 803-221-0169. Or you can email us at the SSBB show at gmail.com. Let's continue this journey together.